Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In our previous lecture, we talked about some of the conditions in Vietnam during the period of French rule and some reasons why there was growing resistance to it. In this lecture, we're going to talk about more of that resistance and focus on one of the most important figures in this course, Ho Chi Minh. At the end of the previous lecture, we noted that there was a great deal of ambivalence in Vietnam over French rule. While some Vietnamese benefited from it, many were also opposed to it, and even those who did benefit in some ways struggled for full acceptance from both the French and from their fellow Vietnamese countrymen. This ambivalence, along with the abuses that many suffered under the French, contributed to a mounting Vietnamese nationalist movement in the early 20th century. Initially petitioning the French for modest political gains and reform of the most abusive practices, protesters eventually grew more vocal and determined. Under French rule, as we've noted previously, the conditions for average Vietnamese declined. Their education system was dismantled in favor of forced labor, producing primarily rubber and coal for French needs. A handful of wealthy Vietnamese benefited from this system. The vast majority suffered. When attempts at modest reform failed, some turned to more revolutionary approaches, especially in the regions of Annam and Tonkin, where, as I mentioned previously, French rule was carried out from a distance. In the cities of Hanoi and Hue, anti-colonial elements formed clandestine political organizations and began lobbying for the removal of the French. The Vietnamese Nationalist Party, by 1929, had some 1,500 members, and most saw outright revolution as the answer. In 1930, they attempted to stage a coup among Vietnamese serving in the French army. Resistance during the period of French rule was constant, and varied from refusal to work, to sabotage, to guerrilla warfare. Periodic revolts failed. These tended to be local, isolated events. French military strength was generally too great, and they also called on their Catholic supporters. And they called on the Montagnards, those mixed ethnic groups from the mountains, who had been considered outcasts under the emperors. Such uprisings were costly. The French, in retaliation, discontinued services, raised taxes to pay for the damages, and ultimately thousands were killed or imprisoned. One important early figure in the movement was Fan Boy Chow. He was a scholar who fueled the movement in the early 20th century. He believed that Eastern peoples had to defend themselves versus Westerners. In 1905, he organized an underground system to send students to Japan to study. In 1908, he helped to create the East Asia League, a transnational alliance intent on ending white rule throughout the Far East. At one point, he said, The French treat our people like garbage. The meek are made into slaves, the strong-minded are thrown into jail. The physically powerful are forced into the army, while the old and weak are left to die. The land is splashed with blood. At the same time, his movement was not completely revolutionary. It remained tied to the wealthy landlords and upper-class intellectuals. He didn't advocate a radical redistribution of wealth and giving land to the poor. He appealed to the privileged minority, not the oppressed majority. We should note that Chow was a revolutionary before the Russian Revolution. So, unlike Ho, he didn't have an important role model to follow. After leading a plot against French officers in 1907, he fled the country, living most of his remaining days in China. In the 1920s, a significant nationalist group, the Vietnamese Nationalist Party, was formed. They advocated political independence in the South and the creation of a Vietnamese Republic. 
Ultimately, it was the communists who would have the strongest appeal in Vietnam. They had a strong nationalist feeling that the French or other outsiders must be overthrown. But they also supported the overthrow of the wealthy landholding Vietnamese class and advocated redistribution of lands to the peasants. It was Ho Chi Minh who emerged as the father of Vietnamese communism. For many in the West, Ho Chi Minh is a little understood sort of caricature in our memory. He represents primarily the leader of the enemy during the American-Vietnamese War. And yet, as we examine Ho Chi Minh's life, career, and thought more closely, on the one hand, it's hard not to sympathize, at least somewhat, with his aims and goals. And on the other, it's impossible not to respect the depth of thought and understanding and education of this man. He was hardly a simple-minded enemy of the United States. There was much more to this character of Ho Chi Minh. Ho would eventually become a vastly popular leader throughout Vietnam. Westerners mocked his, quote, culture of simplicity. But that's part of why he was so popular. He was a Vietnamese everyman. Other leaders sold out to Westerners as soon as they rose enough in society to do anything useful. But Ho kept the same image throughout his career. Ho Chi Minh was born as Nguyen Sin Kung on May 19, 1890. Born in the Neon province in central Vietnam, the site of many rebellions against French rule, and a hotbed of growing nationalism. Neon was a poor province, far from either of the lush deltas. It had a dense population, poor soil, bad climate, and generally harsh lives. The province produced many disenchanted, many scholars, and many revolutionaries. Discontent bred scholars. There was not enough land to work, so many youth studied and read. Ho was the son of Nguyen Sin Sak, who worked for a time in the French administration, but ultimately was dismissed for his anti-French activities. He was a man of great learning and nationalist feeling. He achieved the equivalent of a doctorate degree, and was a teacher for a time. As one Vietnamese said of this period, It was a matter of intelligence. If you were very bright, the choices were quite terrible, because the brighter you were, the more you understood exactly what was happening to you, and you either accommodated yourself to them and played on their side, or you had to leave them and fight them, and either choice was quite terrible. It was much easier for the ordinary man of ordinary ability. Ho's father's feelings influenced his family. One of Ho's sisters stole weapons and was jailed for life. The judge at her sentencing said, Other women bring forth children, you bring forth rifles. Another brother became a revolutionary and died young as a result. Ho's childhood was very hard. He saw poverty, lack of land and opportunities, and a number of rebellions. He was influenced by his father, was raised as a nationalist and anti-French. Ho knew Fan Boy Chow as a young man. He was a friend of Ho's father and occasionally visited the family, and Ho adopted his nationalist zeal. Even as a child, Ho carried messages for the anti-French underground. He went to school in Hue, became a teacher for a time, and studied seamanship and cooking. In 1911, he departed to see the world and would be gone for 30 years. He worked on a French steamer, toured the ports of the world, and saw many other colonies suffering similar treatment to Vietnam. He traveled to the United States for a time. He stayed in England in the early years of World War I, where he worked at the Carlton Hotel, and he saw the excesses and luxuries of the West. He ended up in France during World War I. He met other Frenchmen in France, common men who suffered deprivations and at times poverty. 
they were different from the elites that he had met in Vietnam, and he began to sympathize with the French in France, and was drawn to the French left. Thus, he was taking on a much more sophisticated, worldly perspective than many of those who stayed in Vietnam. It was while in Paris that he adopted the name Nguyen I Quoc, Win the Patriot. He worked odd jobs as an artist, someone who touched up photos. He lived poor, he met other revolutionaries, read a lot, and hung out in bookshops. In 1918, in response to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, Ho drew up a list of eight points for Vietnam, including representation in the French government, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble, and so on. In 1919, during the Versailles Peace Conference, he attempted to present this petition to Woodrow Wilson, urging him to honor the ideas of self-determination that he outlined in the 14 points. Wilson and others refused to even see Ho Chi Minh. After that disappointment, Ho grew even more radical. It convinced him that peaceful, respectful negotiation would not work. It also vaulted his reputation in the Vietnamese nationalist community. He became a hero. As one Vietnamese student said, it was like a flash of lightning. Here was a Vietnamese insisting that his people could be accorded their rights. No two Vietnamese residing in France could meet after this without mentioning the name of Nguyen I Quoc. Ho was drawn to Lenin's idea that all the colonial areas must seek their immediate emancipation by force if necessary. He realized that he would have to overthrow both the French and their elite Asian collaborators. He was one of the founding members of the French Communist Party in 1920, the first avowed Vietnamese communist. He became a charismatic leader, recognized the need to organize the Vietnamese. He organized workers and peasants, and was growing in importance. As one diplomat wrote, From an isolated young man in a hostile community, he was now a sought-after party official in a worldwide charismatic movement with the financial backing of a powerful state, the Soviet Union. Ho traveled widely to Russia in the mid-1920s, Europe, Asia, back to Moscow, and then to China. In 1924, in Moscow, another representative described him this way. When he first arrived, he seemed very inconsequential, but he immediately won the respect and even the affection of us all. Amid these seasoned revolutionaries and rigid intellectuals, he struck a delightful note of goodness and simplicity. He seemed to stand for mere common decency, though he was cleverer than he let on. From 1925 to 27, he lived in Canton, a center for young Vietnamese political exiles. There, he trained hundreds of Vietnamese students to become radical activists and sent them back into Vietnam to begin sowing the seeds of revolution. One of his students there, was Pham Van Dong, who became his most trusted deputy. Pham's father, too, was involved in anti-French activities. He was a gifted intellect and would become the leader of Vietnam after the war ended. During this period, while Ho remained in China, there were a series of premature and ill-fated uprisings in Vietnam. In February 1929, one group assassinated a French official. The French arrested over 200 members of the Vietnamese Nationalist Party in retaliation. A few months later, there was supposed to be a nationwide uprising. It was aborted, but in one town in the Red River Delta, groups carried out the attack on French officials. The French called in airstrikes for the first time and crushed the attack. Watching such things from China, Ho decided the revolutionary efforts in Vietnam needed more direction. He began sending more young men into Vietnam to organize. 
In 1930, in Hong Kong, Ho and his followers formed the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. At that time, he was still called Nguyen I Quoc, Win the Patriot. Thus, Ho Chi Minh, Pham Van Dong, and Von Nguyen Jiap were all part of this organization. We'll be talking much more about Jap as the course goes on. He became one of Ho's great generals during the war against the United States. As one scholar put it, Together, these men formed the nucleus of the movement that fought first the French, then the Japanese, then the French again, and finally the Americans until 1975. In our next lecture, we'll continue discussing the rise of Ho Chi Minh and his compatriots, the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, and ultimately the movement.